everyone. This is the ESOP Guy. We are on a journey to an ESOP. Looking forward to this topic, this episode today. We're going to start off with this. So in this scene, we're in the movie, Rudy, the quarterback, we were at the, the very last game. And if you know this movie, Rudy um, is a historic, this is basically historically true football movie where Rudy goes to try to play for Notre Dame, gets beaten up pretty bad um, because he's so small as a walk-on and eventually makes the team. And But he's so small that the coach never is going to play him until this very last game. And the coach still is not going to play him, but everybody starts chanting Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. Everybody in the on the team loves him because he's he's just put his heart and soul into getting to where he's going. And in this scene, the quarterback is going to throw. He's going to go against what the coach wants to do: throw a touchdown, so that the de- the defense can come in, and that's the only way that Rudy can go get to play on the team. If you didn't know this, we're in football season right now, so I thought this would be super appropriate to use a football movie um, to to introduce this topic and really connect the dots on what we're going to talk about. So today's topic is preparing your company for a site visit. First off, what is a site visit? What's going into that approach? Like, what are we trying to accomplish when we're doing that? I think there's a lot of a lot of parallels when it comes to football and the game plan and everything else. But when I, when I look at what, what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to break down some of the specific goals and strat and strategy on the sell side of preparing for your ESOP site visit. So your company, um, as we do, this is, is going to be thinking and contemplating about how, what is going on and how do you approach that? And I think it's going to be really a a helpful topic for people that kind of puts us into another stage or part of the process of the ESOP that, that would eventually come if you keep going down, you know, through the the approach to selling your company as an ESOP. So if you like the podcast, please share it with a friend. If you're new to this podcast, what this is, is really a resource that we've We've been doing four seasons now to help people think about what an employee stock ownership plan is, how does it really work. The title of this podcast is Journey to an ESOP. So it's really about the journey that people take through the process of of selling their company. When we say to an ESOP, what we really mean is to the trust that gets created in the in the in the process. So the buyer becomes the trust and when and is represented by a, a trustee. So that's that's what this podcast is all about. We do have a website at journeytoanesop.com if you'd like to go there and check out our other episodes. What was that? Who called that play? Well, I gotta tell you, it's just occurred to me what this student body has been chanting for the last two or three minutes. It's the name Rudy. Dan Rudy. A walk-on senior, subject of a future article in yesterday's student newspaper, The Observer. After toiling for two years at Carnegie Field... All right, go get it again! So Rudy gets to come on the field after all that, and... He gets to play in a Notre Dame football game. Why did I choose this movie? I mean, what what was I thinking? There's a million football movies. I know it's football season, so, you know, check the box. I feel like that's so appropriate. You know, our country loves football, college or pro, whatever. I chose this movie because, first off, let me just share with you, my entire family is born out of South Bend, Indiana, Boom. So we're, of course, I didn't grow up there. So, but they're all both sides. My mom and my dad's side of the family were from South Bend, Indiana. So Notre Dame is just part of the whole historical lineage of the family. Second reason I chose Rudy is because I love the underdog. Like who doesn't love the underdog, right? The whole story of an underdog. There's no way he should have been able to play on <clears throat> on Notre Dame, right? 
he's too small. He's, he's not really that athletic, but he's got a heart, right? And he wants to do this. So I think that is so compelling and inspirational. Of course, this movie is like, if I had to boil it all down to one word, I mean, this movie is just inspirational. I feel the same about Aesop's. The Aesop's are for underdogs, for, for people that, you know, can change. It can change all kinds of of potential outlooks when people didn't think that that's, that's what that was even possible. Even this Aesop podcast is is an underdog podcast, right? Where, you know, a small podcast out of Florida, um, the Aesop world is big, the conferences are big, you know, so it's just the whole thing just makes me feel inspir- inspired for Aesop's. The football thing is is simple. It The idea of the football thing as we come back to the topic is just that it takes strategy, you know, for Rudy to do what he done. And, and also just as a football game, right? It takes strategy. It takes planning. And it takes it takes all of that for the game day. The game day for us, <clears throat> I would like to kind of use this as our, our metaphorical game day for us is the site visit. And what I mean by that, if I just give a little bit of context to this this topic or thought process behind the ESOP process is that um, as we go through the steps of doing the ESOP process from a sell side perspective, we start off planning. We do evaluation model. We're planning. We do a feasibility model. We're planning. We get into the to the warrants and the SARS and we start really rounding out from the bank financing. We're just doing planning, planning, planning. You know, similar to, you know, the coach is planning through the way that game's going to work on game day. Ultimately, they the both sides of the of the team are are created or both sides of the equation are created so you have the site the seller side the sell side is is created in the ease out process the buy side is created so now you have two in a sense um teams and they're all going to head into this game um game day which is what we're going to refer to as the site visit so all of this is really kind of fun because it really does um look at this idea of what what do you do to prepare for the site visit. So as we do that, we're going to go into very, um, I, I would say, strategic ways to think about that. Um, but I want to make sure we start off the right way, def- definitionally. The site visit is when the sell side, which includes the sell side advisor for an ESOP transaction, and the company representatives, could be the shareholder, shareholders, could be the Key members of the team, key managers, key people come together and <clears throat> are going to orchestrate a meeting that will involve what we were going to call the SIM, the Confidential Information Memorandum, which is really going to be this PowerPoint presentation, which we've spoken about in other episodes. Now, they come together against, in a sense, the buyer. I don't mean against like in the in a hard way. But really, the buyer is there to evaluate the the company and look at all the different different factors, um, specifics. Now, of course, a lot of this is being communicated to the company or or fi- by the company to the trustee and the valuation firm, which again represents the buy side, through a data room of files of information. So of course the financial information and information on the structure of the business, articles of incorporation, the leases, any potential, you know, liabilities, all of these things and more are being evaluated um, at, at their base level of, of facts that are going to be put in the data room documentation wise that are going to be reviewed by the trustee and the valuation firm. But the site visit really is the opportunity to tell a story about all of the documentation in there that's that's obviously significant and material. Tell the story about the company and tell the story about how this whole thing works. So the site visit really is um, a chance for the company and the sell-side advisor to really work through all of the things that they want, we want, as we talk about it from my perspective, the, the trustee and the valuation firm to really understand. Um, so what we're going to do t- is we're going to just break down <clears throat> really the four pieces of that. And the reason I'm doing this episode two now is I've got multiple site visits going on and it's just, it's just top of mind for me. And 
I think that people always have questions about this as well. And as we think about it, the goal of, of what we're wanting to accomplish in the site visit on the sell side is we want to just be, we want to tell the story the right way. And we want to address what I would say are, are realities and things that you might not see in the financials, things like um, specifics related to the industry, specifics related to say business processes, um, you know, specifics related to the management team, all of these things. So as we, as we dial into this, we're going to want to just go into this one thing at a time and, and really think higher level, you know, how is this, how, how does, how do things work so that the trustee and their goal, as we start thinking about what they want to accomplish is they want to really understand all of those, the parts and pieces, especially the valuation firm that works for the trustee, the independent valuation firm. They're going to want to really understand how those types of things work and so that they can properly assign um, what they believe to be a range of fair market value to prepare for the eventual negotiations, which is um, kind of the, the next game that happens after all of this happens. But the first part is, is if you win here, you can win, obviously, in the negotiations. So that's why it's all connected to um, – you know how how it all fits together from a from a fluent a fluid process, if you will. So the first thing I would say is is organizing before we get into the sim and the details around the sim is really organizing the team on the sell side. Um, before, of course, before we even do that, I would say that we want to make sure that we have um talked about with the team, like who is involved in the sell side representation. Now, this has happened for us a lot of different ways. Let's just kind of go, start with the most simple way is that <clears throat> the you have one shareholder, the one shareholder is dealing with everything with the sell side advisor, nobody else is involved. And I'd say that's probably not the normal. Um, and in that case, it's pretty straightforward. Where did it, me, me, maybe me and the sell side, um, or maybe me and the shareholder are going to walk through the the planning together, and it's going to be very specific. So, um, it could be the who could also be probably more more than often than not would include a shareholder or multiple shareholders plus a a team of people like on the key management side. So maybe maybe that's the maybe non-shareholder CEO, non-shareholder COO, the CFO, um, or just, you know, maybe a, a real key person at some level of the, what we say, the C-suite of, of executives that are going to be part of that. So that's going to be the who on the sell side. Okay, the who on the, on the um, buyer side, of course, is the trustee. They may have other people in their company, in their firm that trustee firm that they may want to have listen in or be part of it. Some trustee firms have their own valuation people in addition to having an independent valuation firm at the meeting. Um, and the valuation firm will probably have their um, representatives that do the the actual real, you know, the I would say the real work, but they do a lot of, a lot of the detailed work around the analysis. Um, in some cases, we'll have the ESOP attorney as part of the site visit, that helps on the sell side. They're the company, what we call the company attorney that does the work to create the plan document. Um, their role in the site visit would just really be to really understand the better understand the transaction, um, really understand the, the corporate structure, the entity structure, making sure the shares, all, all of those types of things make sense for the stock sale. Um, in some cases, they're going to be more, you know, the, the attorneys could be more involved in um, that presentation in other cases they're 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 not so it just really kind of depends um, likewise sometimes the trustee has their attorney in the site visit um, and so again they're it's not necessary you know essential that that's the case but that can happen when we look at the who so, so that's logistically what we want to plan for is okay now that we know who that that is we also want to just be um, mindful of the schedule and start setting some possible dates for site visits that make sense. And I know this sounds kind of basic, but it's it's just part of the process. And I want to be pretty clear about how that really works. And we want to be, obviously, when we're thinking about the site visit, 
we want to be thinking about the closing as well. Like when do we want to get this thing closed? Where are we at with other things in the process itself? So that includes, you know, are we <clears throat> are we at a point where we've actually firmed up the, the ESOP financing with the bank or are we still in the process of doing that? Um, what would be helpful in a site visit to help continue um, to help the bank underwrite the, the ESOP deal? Or if we already have that, how do we use that in terms of strengthening the site visit as well? So, so, so those are some logistics to all of it. So the other, the final thing is, is that most of these meetings are in person, which means that, you know, as we schedule out the site visit, we are thinking about, um, everybody traveling to that location and, and you can say, well, typically that's going to be at the company's office. That just makes the most sense. Um, accomplishes a lot of things for, for both sides. Number one, for the trustee, they, they really do want to, be, better understand the company and be able to see that it's really there and be able to meet the people in person. I think that really does help, um, especially with the valuation firm. There's definitely a um, part of valuation itself is to be able to do a site visit and and see the company and be able to, to from a risk standpoint, know that, that what has been said and been represented is actually really there. And so, so that's going to be all part of what I would say is um, effectively planning out the site visit and really what it is in general. We're going to go outside, inside, and outside. We're going to get him on the run, boys. Once we get him on the run, we're going to keep him on the run. And then we're going to go, 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 go. And we're not going to stop until we get across that goal line. This is team they say is good. Well, I think we're better than them. They can't lick us. What do you say, man? I love this scene. This is where Rudy kind of stands up and he's talking about, um, he's impersonating um, the coach for Notre Dame. And just, it's a, it's just kind of like helps to think about like how much he loves football, how much he loves the game and why he's doing it. And so as we think about that and transition into the, to the site visit conversation, um, from the logistical planning to what we're trying to accomplish is now working through on the sell side, what we're going to be working through is a collaborative process of, of evaluating how we want to go about presenting the company. And, and we think about the deliverable here, the deliverable is going to be representative in a, in the confidential information memo, which for our purposes, what that really means is we're going to be really breaking down this presentation um, in in components to try to do this in a way that will be the site visit in a way that will be efficient and help accomplish some things. Um, one of the things that we're going to try to accomplish is <clears throat> is preemptively answering questions that we know the trustee and the valuation firm are going to have. And so part of that in answering those questions is, is going to be to really think about um, the purpose, like the goal behind what the question is that they might have. So that sounds a little circular. So the, let me just go through the first, the first part that we want to think about and, and educate the client or the trustee and evaluation firm on is we want them to really understand. And this really for us has started in the way we would approach presenting the deal memo to the trustee initially for the interviews that we would have, and out of that, what we what we're trying to do within the deal memo and the and the sim is to try to really nail down the business model that the company is operating out of, and where it's unique, maybe where it's not unique, how they function as a business within an industry. So we're going to be very definitional in terms of the industry part of it to identify um, in the sim really who and, and what we're doing in the terms of the industry so that the trustee really and valuation firm really have that concrete. So if I back up a little bit, what we're what we're really going to be doing is when we when we present this, we're going to present an agenda of what I would say is four primary categories. That includes the industry overview, that includes the company overview, 
That'll include financial highlights and financial overview with um, some details regarding, of course, the forecast in that. Then we're going to include to follow up or conclude is the structure, the transaction, the ownership, the entities, those kind of things to make sure that those are very um, clear in everybody's mind as far as how that as how that transaction is going to work. So that that's kind of the what I would you know wanted to start with. I should have started with that was the agenda. Um, so if I if I start to kind of just go into first the industry, what I was saying really is that. An industry like construction or an industry like architectural and engineering, an industry like retail, those are just general industries, right? We know that. Like that that just makes sense. Now, in some cases, the business may just be like they're just a general contractor in a construction industry. And it is what it is, like, right? But in within that though, the general contractor could be um, for instance, I've done this before, I've had this type of ESOP client before. They, they could be a general contractor that has a, a specialized service experientially with a specific industry. Like, for instance, a general contractor that does builds a lot of auto, auto dealerships could be a general contractor that builds a lot of grocery stores or schools or, you know, that's their kind of that's their their real focus is that. Now, if that's the case, the first part of it is is to really understand in the industry part of the site visit is, of course, where they where they fall in the general side, and then how if they do have this, how do they really deal in that industry? What are they specifically bringing to the industry? They may have a, a very specific business model as well. They may have an approach to that industry that is very um, unique in the way that they. Uh, provide services, for instance. I have a, a client who does, um, y- you know, the way that their services are provided is is very is very um, unique in the way that they compete because of the um, the design part of the construction is going to be done at at higher levels with architects, and so they're designing they're being designed into programs or or contracts. And so that makes their their part very unique. And, you know, one thing I would just say, if I take a step back and, and just talk about this for a second, strategy wise, when we're doing this, and the reason I'm getting into the specialty nature of companies is that we don't, that we want to support the strength of the company if it's there, that creates a very, um, more a more predictable revenue model than if they were just a general company subject to the economic forces. And so there if there there's no competitive advantage, let's just get real if there's no competitive advantage or there's no other way that they can go in and compete, then they're just subject to the the general economic forces. And now we're just dealing with, hey, what's happening in the industry? Are we is the industry growing? Um what's happening to uh, the customer base in the industry, what's happening to the demand, um, could be what's happening to the supply of whatever um, services or products that are being delivered. So when we do have a specialty, what I'm able to do is kind of leverage that into the the strategic part of the sim into really helping to show why, eventually why our forecast is really reasonable. Now that's a whole nother ball game. When we get to talk about forecasts, that's going to be a whole nother ball game because um, the point there is just going to be that we are we're proving out in this process of the reliability, um, predictability, and again keeping with the ease, the sustainability of what from a business pure business perspective this company has. That is something that trustee and the valuation firm are going to be evaluating because. If there if there were a flash in the pan, okay, in in the industry section, that means that the company is going to flash out eventually, right? And then we had this reason in the business, and now it's really the, there's really no demand, or you know, just being extreme. The trustee and the valuation firm have to think about the long term nature of what they're buying, not just to support the forecast, right, for valuation purposes, but also to support that this makes sense 
from a from a buyer's perspective and not having some long term big issues with with the company. We can all go back to some big examples of this in in economic history, right? So, you know what happened with the typewriter companies when the computer came out, right? Eventually, word processors were created. Eventually, 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 the typewriter business was a declining industry, and it has all but ceased, right? What happened with um, the Uber and taxi companies, right? So didn't kill them, but Uber but took a huge market share from taxi companies, Airbnb and hotels, all these different examples. We need to be really at this higher level of, of the presentation. We need to be really clear about what is going on in our industry. Now, if we have a situation where we do see some some potential transition, disruption, things that are happening in that industry, we also have to implicit, or not implicit, but in, we also have to start in, including in the conversation the strategic nature of the company's plan around those types of things. So it may be that there is some disruption in the in the industry. It may be that there are some things in this industry section that kind of point to, oh, well, we've got we've got some strategic, you know, forks in the road that we got to start looking at that might lead the company strategically in their in their business plan to say, hey, we're we're going to let's just say it's a geographic restraint in the company for whatever reason needs to get into another geography. Well, our plan is to get into another geography and we're going to do it this way by acquisition. Um, or we, you know, we have a scalability issue. We're going to, you know, the company's growing and we have to scale up. We're, we're trying to meet the demand. How are we going to do that? So, so part of this is going to lead into the company overview and the, and the specific things as we get to that. But, but what we're doing is we're setting the foundation um, in the industry section to dig deeper into some of those concepts. Um, if we have a very, robust industry that's growing and we're a big market player in that, that's easy. I mean, that's like, okay, we're just going to keep growing with the industry. Um, there's not a lot of work, but if we do have some challenges in the industry, we need to identify really clearly what those are. Um, look at the diversification in this section on, on not only our business model, but how we strategically have diversified the revenue, not just by customer, um, it could be by products and services. It could be the, you know, the the R and D the company is doing now that will lead to potentially new sales. So, so you can see how this kind of whole thing, or the reason this is so much fun for for people that do like MBA business work, it's like it it's it's getting into a lot of the corridors of things that that help to help to communicate how the company's key management and shareholders are thinking. And how they're thinking about really more about the future and using some of the historical stuff of the past. So once we've nailed down for in the industry section, once we've nailed down, say, the the business model itself, um, we're going to want to really nail down in the in the industry, we're going to want to nail down the customers that they deal with. And all of these are going to have potential research to be done around the trends, you know, associated with those with those customers and with those industries. And so as the trends um, dictate potential growth within say a customer grouping, like um, my construction company that does auto dealerships. And we know with auto dealerships, you know, what, what we would research is, you know, Hey, how, how often do they rebuild their, their auto dealerships and how many new ones do we need in the next five to 10 years? All of that is really good information that will help build the case for the the sustainability and the futurability of the company to meet the forecast eventually when we get there in the sim. And so, so that's going to be important. Um, the buying pattern, the changes. You know, if I have um, a government related customer, what's happening with the government and how there that might change. If I have a um, you know researching and understanding that the, the the profile and the target market of those types of customers is going to be super helpful. And the other side is, and not as much as as the customer side, but really the supplier side can be part of this industry analysis because um, we all seen different things happen over the last several years with, say, supply chain and how that could really affect 
negatively the ability of a company to meet the obligations in a very good marketplace with a lot of demand from customers, that demand from customers doesn't really matter if the supply chain can't be met. And so if they're needing materials to fulfill a contract um, and those are being held up because all of the materials are on cargo boats and they're stuck out in the ocean and they can't be delivered, all of that has to be um, considered as well. So so in the combination of all this, what we really are on our game plan as we start thinking about it is we want to keep drilling into these questions. And, and I think you kind of know this as I go through it. As I start with the first item in the agenda, it's really a higher level topic. It's a bit softer than getting into the company information yet, um, but it's so, so necessary because we can't assume that the trustee and the valuation firm really understand our situation. They may have done a lot of construction companies as clients, or they may have done a lot of whatever we are as, as you know, in prior transactions, historical information they might have. They might have all of that, but we need to steer the ship towards really helping them educate what, what your company is. So as we think about this, this, this whole topic is going to take some time for us to develop. And we want to go into some of these details because I think it really does matter as we're thinking about the strategy of having a successful site visit and what that means to the ESOP process. As we break down these pieces, what I'm hoping you'll get out of it is is being able to um, think about your process ahead of the time. And one one thing as I as I start to close, I want to I want to make mention of this because I think it's just really important for whomever you might use as a sell side advisor. A lot of the things that I'm talking about in this site visit in this sim that we're helping a client create, they should have been talked about at the very beginning. And in the process itself, I would say the ESOP process itself, one thing that I think is important to keep keep in mind, it is an integrated process between all of these different steps that we've organized into 10 steps, and they can be just as easily more or less, but 10 steps. Each of the things that are being done in the modeling, in the valuation, or the modeling of feasibility, or all of these things are going to start to produce um, information and data for us to supply for what we're doing here. And one of the things I would say for people that are just starting the process is, you know, having and contemplating what the site visit's going to look like before you even get there. So, so a good sell side advisor should be walking when they do the valuation modeling and the feasibility modeling, they should be asking some of these questions that are going to be asked in the site visit almost predictively or from a forward thinking standpoint. And so as it's integrated and it's done really well, a lot of these concepts, what we're doing here with a client at this point is we're really just digging into some of this stuff a little bit deeper, deeper, deeper than what we we might have had more from a higher level standpoint, but it's deeper and deeper so that um, you, you are prepared to go through this process. And some companies, I would just say in general on the site visit, have have a really strong um, background when it comes to either the presentation side or, you know, they may not have gone out and tried to raise capital before. They may have gone out and even tried to sell the company before. So they, they already have some maybe level. So it's not like you have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you just have to make sure that everybody's on the same page in the team as you prepare for this very important step. So with all of that, I wanted to say thank you for listening today. If you have questions, go to our website at journeytoanesop.com. If you like the podcast, share it with a friend. Go out and do a five-star rating. I think that's always helpful for people. Um, but don't do not do that if you don't like it. And, you know, I totally get it. So, But if you do like it, if that would be great if you could do that. So with all that, thank you guys for listening today. And we're looking forward to our next step on this journey to an ESOP. Mm-hmm.